Good morning. To Foxy's. We are on the record. You know Foxy's. This is a digital video deposition of Ziamara Flores Hoagland testifying the matter of Ferguson et al. versus County of Los Angeles et al. in the United States District Court, Central District of California, case number CV120-06865. <coughs> Today's deposition is being held at Sorovian Law, located at 100 North Grand Boulevard, Glendale, California. Today's date is March 19th, 2014. The time on the video monitor is 10:12 a.m. My name is Irving Fong. I'm a legal video specialist with Jordan Media, Inc., located at 1228 Madison Avenue, San Diego, California. The certified shorthand reporter today is Cindy Vega with Crime Reporting. Will all counsel please state your appearances for the record? Sean McMillan appearing for plaintiffs. We got uh, David Weiss for defendants. Thank you. The witness may now be sworn. Xiomara Flores Olguin, Department of Children and Family Services. Perfect. When you raise your hand, right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Ma'am, can you please state and again, I know you've already stated your name, but state it again for us and spell it. Xiomara. Flores hyphen Olguin X I O M A R A Flores F L O R E S hyphen Olguin H O L G U I N. And what shall I call you? Shall I call you Miss Flores Holguin? Miss Holguin? Miss Flores? What do you prefer? Miss Flores Holguin. Okay. Do you have a middle name? It's Xiomara. That's the X I O M A R A? Yes. yes. And what's your first name? Maria. Have you ever gone by any other names aside from um, Maria <coughs> or Xiomara? No. Okay. How about any other names besides Flores Holguin or Flores or Holguin? Um, just the floor, either sometimes the flores, sometimes the flor flores olguin. Okay. How long have you worked for the County of Los Angeles? 28 years. That's a long time? Yes. Have you always worked for the same department? Yes, I have. What department is that? the Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Services. <coughs> when you started, what position did you fill? I started as a children's social worker trainee. CSW trainee. CSW. I'm in the habit of calling them SSW. Different counties <laughs> call them different yes. things. And that would have been in... Uh, October of 1985. Thank you. It saves me from demonstrating my poor math skills. It's okay. Go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather not. <laughs> it gets embarrassing. I already have enough performance anxiety. I don't need that, too. <laughs> when you started in uh, October 1985, at that point in time, did you hold any certificates or degrees? My bachelor's degree. Was that a BA or a BS? It was a BA. In what? In child development. From? Uh, the uni uh, Cal State University, Los Angeles. My mom went there. She was a school teacher for 37 years. Mm. Yeah. Did at any point in time between 1985 and the present, did you receive any further um, degrees, certificates, or licenses? Yes, I did. I graduated in May of 1998 from the University of Southern California with a master's degree in social work. Was that an MS? MSW. MSW. Are you a licensed clinical social worker? I am not. Have you undertaken any of the course study necessary to become a licensed clinical social worker? I have not. Okay. 
Do you hold any other degrees, certificates, or licenses? I have a um, certificate in um, gang subculture. That's interesting. When did you get that? I received that in uh, the year 2004. I don't remember the month, I apologize. That's okay. As we go through the day, um, a lot of the things we're going to be talking about happened you know, a few years ago, and I recognize you may not remember exact dates, times, or even exact words that people said or that you said. All I'm entitled to is your best recollection, your best estimate, so what you're doing here so far is perfectly fine. I don't expect you to be able to tell me that on you know, October 14th at 2 p.m. you walk down the aisle to get your degree. Just October is good enough. Thank you. So I, I appreciate your effort in that. Just to let you know, estimates are fine. Mm -hmm. okay. The certificate in gang subculture, was that something that you did out of your own interest or was it something that you did as part of an effort to advance in your career with social services? Uh, it was a training that was provided to uh, social workers uh, within the Department of Children and Family Services, a unit called the MART, Multi-Agency Response Team. I was the supervisor of the unit and we were given this training at uh, Sheriff's Star Center. I'm sorry? Sheriff's Star Center in Star Whittier. Center? That's what they call it, Star Center. It was a 40-hour training. Was there any kind of test or examination at the end of that training? No, there was not. But at the end of that training, you did receive some sort of certification to demonstrate that you underwent the training? I did. Okay. And that's the certificate that you're talking about? That that's uh, correct. Okay. Do you hold any other certificates or licenses or degrees besides the one in gang subculture? I don't recall. <coughs> When you became an employee of Los Angeles County DCFS in 1985, prior to picking up a caseload, were you required to complete any form of training offered by the County of Los Angeles? I received the training once employed by the Department of Children and Family Services, so I was trained prior to uh, uh, a caseload assignment. Okay, and what was that training called? It was the DCS at the time we were the Department of Children's Services and it was our training academy, um, six weeks long, I remember. Was that six weeks, uh, five days a week, eight hours a day? That or? is correct, okay. yes. So it was just like a college course or something yes. like that? Yes, yes. Was there any examination or certification process at the end of that training that you recall? I don't recall. Okay. How long did you remain a CSW trainee? I was two years. Okay, so about October 1987 or so? That is correct. And what did you move into? I moved into a CSW2, a Children's Social Worker 2. I tested. There, the department used to give oral exams, and I passed. And I was a Children's Social Worker 2. In, in addition to the oral examination um, that you had to pass before promoting to a CSW2, was there also a required course of study or additional training that you had to do? We, we received training um, in our unit um, provided by our supervisor and then we had outside training and conferences. I recall, don't recall exactly, but that was, and it's still practice that we receive regular training. Okay, I, I recognize that um, you receive regular training as part of your job. What I'm wondering is in order as a prerequisite to promoting from one level to the next, for example, from a CSW trainee to a CSW2, is there some specific training that you have to have before you can apply for that promotion? 
Obviously, I, I, I don't recall, okay. but I qualified because I did take the exam and I passed. Okay. Okay, and how long did you stay a or remain a CSW2? I believe I, I I don't recall. What position do you hold now? I am a children services administrator two. So CSA two. two correct. How many levels, how many steps do we go through? to transition from a CSW2 to a CSA2? I became a supervisor in 1998 upon and, graduation. And what do we call that position? Is a there an acronym? Super, a supervising children's social worker, SCSW. <coughs> I was an SCSW from 1998 until February 5th of this year. I promoted in February, on February the 6th. Okay. So then on February the 6th, since February the 6th, you've been a CSA too? Correct. Okay. And how many steps are there between, in fact, I may be able to just phrase this as a question. You can tell me if I'm right or wrong, because we did take a deposition yesterday and I got some of this background information there. Am I correct that there is one remaining step between a CSW2 and a SCSW, and that would be the CSW3? That is correct. I do not recall when I became a CSW3 However, I applied, um, and, and I apologize, I don't remember the date, mm -hmm. uh, but to have promoted to an SCSW, I had to be a CSW3. Right. I just don't recall, I apologize. Do you but I was, I have been a CSW trainee, CSW2, CSW3, SCSW. Okay. Do you remember the year? I don't necessarily need the date. Do you, do you know about how long you were a SCSW? From 1998 until oh, the yeah, present. Oh, that's right. Do you know about how long you were a CSW2? Now I'm doing the math. Maybe five years, six years. So maybe just a rough ballpark, 92, 93, does that sound about right for promoting to a CSW3? Okay. Yes, I okay. believe so. Sounds about right. And then you remained a CSW3 for about five years until you promoted to an SCSW in 1998. Correct. Now, when you were a SCSW, particularly within the last five years or so, six years, I'm sorry, within the last six years, what unit were you attached to? I was attached to the multi-agency response team, MART. Okay, so you've been with the MART team since 2004? January 2004. And you remained with the MART team <coughs> for your entire time as an SCSW? I was in SCSW at the, I was promoted at the Emergency Response Command Post, ERCP. Okay, so would it be accurate to say that um, for the last six years you have been an emergency response SCSW? That is correct. Give me a little bit of background on emergency response because I'm not sure exactly here in Los Angeles what function that unit performs. I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, that for immediate response referrals, 
you guys deal with those, right? Yes. What other types of referrals do you deal with? New allegations that may be called in during the emergency response investigation. Okay, so the new, new allegations in that sort of situation, they may not rise to the level of something that's immediate. They're just new allegations that come about as a result of the investigation of an emergency response referral? No, it's typically called into the child protection hotline mm -hmm. and a mandated reporter, an anonymous caller, calls the child protection hotline, reports a family for abuse or neglect. Uh, the intake evaluator, evaluator at the child protection hotline will take the information and they, the family may populate either um, as history, we had prior uh, investigations with, with this family, or it may be, again, a new allegation while the department is investigating or may have uh, an open investigation on the family. Okay. I've seen the term five-day referrals. Is a five-day referral something that the emergency response unit would deal with investigating? My understanding that in LA County, uh, yes and no. We do have immediate and five-day responses. Okay. Yes. And emergency response is the unit that would deal with investigating the five-day? That five is correct. Day. Okay. And what about, there was another term that popped up. Second. There was another term that popped up the other day, and it was expedited, an expedited referral. Have you heard of such a thing? An expedited response referral is a a referral that is called in by law enforcement with children in custody. And um, that's what I know. Okay. That's an expedited okay, so the, the ones that I, I have are the um, immediate response, the five day referral, and the expedited uh, referrals. Are there any other types of referrals that your unit, the emergency response unit, deals with? Not that I know. No, that's, that's it. Okay. Have you reviewed any documents in preparation for your deposition here today? No, only my detention report in the presence of Mr. Weiss. Okay. And Jamie, that's it. And oh, and Jamie. Jamie, Jamie has, uh, yes. Okay, got it. How long ago did you do that? Um, this morning. At no other point in time before this morning have you, no. you reviewed any of the documents related to this case? I mean. No. Have you reviewed any of the delivered service logs? No. Okay. Have you reviewed any of the uh, structured decision-making assessments? No. Okay, have you reviewed any of the training materials? Yes, I did. Okay, which training materials did you review? I believe it was the one that was provided in 2009. Was that also this morning? Yes. Is this thing? That's the one that, uh, let me Is it exhibit two? It. I think it's, a, a lot, I have a number on it, but. Um, was that the one from yesterday? This 2011. Okay, I'm I don't sorry. remember. They all look similar to me. This is the one that we looked okay. at. I'm not sure what it was. I just glanced, I had her glance at this thing. Mm -hmm. okay. She's familiar with the trainings. Okay. Yeah, I would expect as a. Yeah. Uh, it's actually, an ASM 2 now. We didn't get into that. What does an ASM 2 do? I'm not an ASM. I'm, I'm sorry. Let me get that right. <laughs> we don't know what an ASM 2 That's does. That's correct. I don't. <laughs> I have an ASM in a different case. <laughs> I get all these acronyms messed up. Yeah. A CSA2. What is a CSA2? A Children's Services Administrator is um, works 
any particular unit uh, within the Department of uh, Children and Family Services specialized unit. I'm currently working in the Office of Board Relations. Office of what? Board Relations. What's that? So I typically work with the Board of Supervisors. We have five supervisorial districts in Los Angeles County and we work with their children's deputies whenever a complaint is made against the department or a inquiry is made. Okay. Do you uh, interface at all with the DCFS Civil Rights Unit? Um, just on this case? I mean, with risk management, civil rights? Are you aware of the existence, or, or do you know if uh, Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Services has an internal civil rights unit <coughs> that investigates civil rights complaints? We, anytime a complaint is made, we investigate. Okay. So it depends uh, who makes the complaint. Mm -hmm. Well, for example, um, if I refer to clients, who would, who would that be? Public inquiry. That's my office. So if a client calls and files a complaint, it's reported to the uh, Office of Board Relations or Public Inquiry and we initiate the investigation. And when we talk about clients, we're referring to parents. Parents. Who parents, are, relatives, mm -hmm. foster parents. Who are in some way involved in um, the juvenile dependency system in Los Angeles County, correct? Correct. Are you aware of whether or not the outcome of your investigations is reported to the state of California? I'm not aware. So you just report to the Board of Supervisors? That is correct. Okay. Do you... Well, sometimes we do receive, uh, and again, I just started. Okay. Uh, I've only been with the section Sure, for about board. a month. That's right. right. That's right. And I do have other responsibilities. So sometimes we do get um, calls from the California Department of Social Services but I haven't been directly involved. Okay. Are you aware for how long um, Los Angeles County DCFS has had a mechanism in place by which it could in or would investigate client complaints of alleged civil rights abuses? I think since I started working with the department, we've always had that mechanism. So you've always had the the civil rights unit available for clients to register the complaints. That is correct. Okay. I'm kind of not understanding exactly what you do now. Are you sort of like a liaison? Yes, I am. Okay, you so can describe me as a liaison. Okay, so what would happen then? is you would, if there's an investigation or something like that, somebody will report to you and then you will report that to the board? The board may, again, it depends if the call is received from the board children's deputies. They've received a call from a constituent mm -hmm. and they refer it to us and we initiate that investigation. Okay, and what is your unit called again? It's the Office of Board Relations and Public Inquiry. Is that a new department? No, it isn't. It is not. Do you know how long um, the Office of Board Relations has been around? I don't recall, but as long as I've been there. Been there. Do you know how many CSA2s there are? How many people are there like you in this unit? I'm the only one in that unit as a CSA2. We have a CSA3. We have a CSA2 myself and we have um, I believe four CSA ones and correct me if I'm wrong I don't know the order of these things but I imagine that the chain of command goes something like CSA 3 then CSA 2 is the next step up then a CSA 1 is the supervising CSA or do I have that backwards you have it backwards okay so CSA 3 is the top that is correct CSA 2 is the middle? Yes. And CSA 1 is the entry position? That's correct. And you went from a C, 
SW3 directly to a C. Oh no, I CSA2 position. I went from an SCSW to a CSA2. All right, let me try this again. I have that in my notes. There's just all these acronyms are rattling me around. There is a test at the end. <laughs> so I can remember them all. You better take close notes. Okay, let's try this again. Am I correct that you went directly from a SCSW position to a CSA2 position? Actually, I had to apply uh -huh. to um, become uh, eligible for a CSA2 appointment. I applied, my application was processed, and I was banded. Banded, what does that mean? Meaning that you are ranked based on the experience and the training okay. that you have, and I was on band one. When vacancies become available in a CSA2 position, if you're interested in the position, you apply, your application is reviewed, and if you qualify, you're called in for an interview. When you interview, and if you're selected, then the position is offered. So it was offered to me and I accept it. So there's basically two applications that you had to go through to get the position. That is correct. The initial so to, to get banned. Problem, absolutely. And then the uh, application, application I submitted okay. for the position and I was eligible and I qualified. And then there was an interview too. And there was the interview process. Was there any test associated with that, aside from the application process twice and the interview? Did you have to take a written test at all? So uh, what you do is you apply. There's the application, and that's considered an exam. I got gotcha. you. Am I correct that the application is, is substantial? There's a lot of material there? Yes. And it probably took quite a bit of time just to, for you just to fill out the application, right? That's correct. Are you scored on the application, if you know, or is that what the banding is on the first application? Repeat the question. Are you scored? Is there a score yes. given? Yes, yes, I'm scored. And, it, and I presume that's how they come up with the, what you refer the to band. as the band. Okay. Yes. Okay. I don't let him finish his question. Mm -hmm. I know you're helping because you know where the question's mm -hmm. going, but the most important person other than you is the court reporter, and so she has to take down question, answer, question, answer. So wait till he finishes his question, and then answer. I've been sort of bad about that, too. <laughs> I've been cutting you in. Um, I'll try not to do I'm that. I'm not in, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not involved, but I can hear it, and I, so every once in a while, I look over at the court reporter, and I think, oh, I should remind you of that, because it's a little different. So she has to take down question, Going back to when we were talking about your work in the emergency response unit, and you were telling me about how new allegations might come in to an existing investigation, and you used a term called populate, and I'm wondering, what did you mean by that? What I meant by that was that when the mandated reporter or the caller calls our child protection hotline, they give a name of the um, children are at risk or abused, mm -hmm. and we enter it into our system, and that information comes up. Okay, so when you say populate, Again, correct me if I'm wrong, what you mean is that there's a form on the computer screen, you enter a name, and if there is a history for that name in your database, then portions of that form will automatically populate? I don't know. I, I believe so. I don't work at the Child Protection Hotline. Okay. Well, I, I'm just wondering what you meant by populate. What are we talking about? 
I believe I said that when a mandated, mandated reporter calls in mm -hmm. to the Child Protection Hotline, they are typically asked name of the family, name of the children, and that information is entered. And we may have history with the family, mm -hmm. or we may have a current investigation. Okay. And that will become apparent on the computer when this, when whoever's taking the call types in the name. I believe so. Have you ever yourself actually worked um, in that unit, the hotline, where the hotline calls come in? I worked in that unit in 1990. It was the Child Protection Hotline or Child Abuse Hotline and Emergency Response Command Post. In 1990, they were both merged and the calls would come in on what we used to know as old-fashioned telephones. Well, the little remember? rotary phones. That's yeah, right. I remember those. I that's right. Those. And it was located at the McLaren Hall, and that's where I reported. Okay. But it was only short term. I think it was only two months. So you only worked there for two months? Two months, and then I only worked the emergency response command post. Okay. So within the last, um, let's say, 10 years or so, you have not actually worked with the child abuse hotline unit. No, I have not. So when you're talking to me about how you believe the calls come in and data populates, that's something you received in training. It's not based on personal experience. That's correct. I, and okay. the referral is um, received, mm -hmm. and that information is contained in that referral, the history okay. of the family. So just, just for my own edification, so I understand the process that you're describing. I recognize that you haven't worked there in a long time. And what you're telling me is based on either what you've heard from other people or what you've seen in training. But I think I'm still entitled to try to get a little bit of an understanding, at least of what you know. Um, so with that proviso, let me, let me make sure I've got it. And again, correct me if I'm wrong. A call comes into the hotline, the, whoever answers the call, will take down the information that, that will include the name or identify, uh, identifying information of the either victim or perpetrator. They will put that in the computer and essentially do a search to see if there's a history. If there is a history, then that will populate to some other report or form that will be generated that will then be passed to the emergency response unit. Is that correct? I believe so. Okay. And that's where you worked before your current job is in the emergency response unit. Right? I understand that you're asking me if I worked at the child protection hotline. No, no, no. The emergency Yes. Yes, I worked at yeah, the what, emergency what, what? response command post. I, I mean, know I know okay. let me Sorry. finish this question because I think it's the core reporter is doing a good job, I can see, but let's maybe slow it down because I hear, Sean, I think sure. the record might be um, a little choppy. A little choppy. So question, answer. Just slow it down a little I know bit. this is not a emergency response referral. I'm just using a piece of paper by way of example. I'm a, a hotline worker. I just took all the data from somebody. I put it all in. I populated the form and I print it out. So I have something now that's called what? An emergency response referral? I believe so. Okay. And then somehow, whether it's electronically or physically, I take it over and deliver it, deliver it to your unit, the emergency response unit, correct? I don't know what the process is at the Child Protection Hotline. Somehow, though, you get an emergency response referral, right? It is assigned. Is that typically done by email, in person, a physical piece of paper? How is that typically done? What they do is they inbox it. That was my recollection. The referrals were inboxed. What does that mean? They were assigned to a section within the office. Ken, when you say inbox, is that like an email? Or is that a physical mailbox where a piece of paper is put in a, a mailbox that's labeled inbox? I believe it was um, electronically. Okay. 
Okay, so we get these emergency response referrals from the hotline that get inboxed. How do those then get assigned to a particular investigator? I do not know. So you, you were not ever involved in that assignment process? I was uh, responsible for assigning uh, referrals. Okay. At one time, yes. When? Uh, well, Any? I. Go ahead. Since I've been supervising, as a supervisor, you have the responsibility to assign once you're given that referral. Okay. How would you get the referral? It would be inboxed. To your to inbox? Me, yes. Okay. As a supervisor. So you had your own inbox as a supervisor? That is correct. Okay. And you would go check it every day? I would check it, yes. Okay. And if you found a referral in there, then you would figure out which of your subordinate social worker investigators you wanted to assign it to, right? Yes. How would you go about making that decision? It was um, based on language. If a uh, social worker is bilingual and the family is Spanish-speaking, you would assign it to a Spanish-speaking or a bilingual worker, um, depending on caseload. Those were the two main factors? Yes. And that was the same for the entire period of time that you were a SCSW from 1998 until February 5th, 2014, am I correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, Going back to the circumstance you described earlier where there is an ongoing investigation um, through emergency response and there are new allegations that come in, is there any requirement that those new allegations go through the hotline process that we discussed a little earlier? It's vague and ambiguous, overly broad, it's hypothetical, but you may answer that you can. Well, just describe for me. Describe for me the process by which new allegations that aren't in the original emergency response, how do those new allegations make their way into the current investigation? Well, again, same objections, but y if you understand, you may, you may answer. Would you repeat the question? Yeah, and maybe a little background will help. Er earlier you were telling me there were there are several different types of referrals that you guys investigate over at emergency response. One was the immediate response, the other was the five-day <coughs> response, and then the third one was the expedited response. You recall that testimony? Correct. Okay. And then you had also told me that, that on some occasions where you have a investigation in, on one of those three different types of categories, you have an investigation ongoing, sometimes a new allegation will surface. How does that, or is there a process in place by which that new allegation makes its way into the investigation? If there's no process, that would be the answer. If there is a process, then I think I'm entitled to know the process. All new allegations are reported to the Child Protection Hotline. And then would I be correct that with those new allegations, the hotline would th then generate a secondary related uh, emergency response referral and that would get put over into your inbox? Is that how it goes or is there some other method? If it's the same family uh -huh. and you're currently assigned, it would typically go to you if it's during working hours. Okay. If it's after hours, it's the emergency response command post that handles. Okay, so it may be some other uh, supervisor or some other worker completely, depending on the time that it comes that the new referral or new allegation comes in. Yes. Okay. And is that the same, for example, where it's the same family but a different child? Do you understand the question? It could be a new baby born. Mm -hmm. 
and a mandated reporter calls. It's circum. It depends. It's case by case. Okay. Well, let, let's say, for example, we have a emergency response referral that came in on the hotline. It's a five-day referral. Your investigator is currently investigating the referral. And then there's a sibling, and that sibling is now discovered. In order to bring that sibling into the investigation, into the dependency process, do we follow the same method that you described earlier, where we make a call to the hotline and generate a new referral, or is there some other method? No, we add, we add that child to the investigation. Okay. So there doesn't need to be, according to Los Angeles County's uh, practices, there does not need to be a new referral for the sibling. It's vague and ambiguous, unintelligible. Um, I don't mean that as an insult. I'm talking about the form of the question. You may answer. Well, let me ask you, did you understand the question? It's case by case. Well, what I'm looking for, and may, maybe you didn't understand the question, is, is you understand that Los Angeles County, they can't come out, the county itself can't come out and micromanage every single case you handle, right? The supervisors can't sit there and say, on this case I want you to do this, on that case I want you to do that, and ma micromanage it. They can't do that, can they? Well, again, it's vague and ambiguous, but if you understand, you can answer. You can answer. When we receive a referral, an emergency response referral, mm -hmm. the reporting party may not know who are the members of the identified family. Mm -hmm. It is our responsibility when we respond to ensure that we've asked if there are other children, that's a part of the investigation. We okay. must ensure child safety. Okay. And if there are other children, but there are no allegations as to those other children, what is the process by which you bring them into the system? We... Uh, I'm sorry, just vague and ambiguous, but you may answer. We will bring children into the system when we believe that they are at risk. Okay. I understand that when you believe that children are at risk, you will bring them into the system. What is the process by which you do that? We interview. Anything else? We conduct an assessment. Anything else? We look at history, if there is. Anything else? And you do all of that as to an unreported sibling without first receiving a hotline report? Am I getting that right? Overly broad as to circumstances. If you can answer the question, you can. As I said, we don't always know mm -hmm. when we are going to respond to a home who makes up the family. Mm -hmm. And that's because the mandated reporter may not know. Are but you, go ahead. But our job is to, again, account for all of the children in the family. Okay. Are you aware of a case called RCV County of Los Angeles? I am not. Okay. As part of your job duties in uh, acting as a liaison between the Board of Supervisors and the Office of, I'm sorry, what, what was it that you called the unit, the Office of Board Relations? Do you ever get an opportunity to review published decisions that define the work that you're the scope of the work that your social workers do? No. Do you participate in any way in the formulation of training materials? During your time as a um, SCSW, did you ever learn in any of your trainings that each child 
needs to be assessed individually as to each parent where there are accusations of abuse or neglect. Well, that's overly broad as to circumstances and assumes facts, not in evidence, and it's argumentative, but you may answer the question if you understand it. If you didn't learn it or you have some different view, then I'm entitled to know that. No, I did learn that. You did learn that. Okay. When did you first learn that? I've always assessed all of the siblings, all of the children, in every family. And did you also learn, well actually that doesn't respond to my question, it's non-responsive, move to strike. Can I have my question reread? She said, I did learn that, you said you did learn that. When did you first learn that? When? The date, roughly, the year? Oh, when I was in training as a CSW. Oh, so all the way back in 1985 is when you learned that, correct? Is that what you're telling me? I believe so. Was that in a formal training? That was in the training I received. Okay. Do you know whether or not the County of Los Angeles still maintains that uh, the written materials from that DCS six-week training academy? I don't know. Who would you talk to to find out if you can get a copy of the written training materials that you received back in um, that training academy in 1985? I don't know. Uh, David, if we send you a, or rather, will you try to produce that for us informally, or do you prefer that we give you a formal written request? Well, why don't you send me a formal written request? My suspicion is materials from 1985 probably do not exist, but that's just a suspicion. So you can either send me a letter or send me a formal request, and I'll look for that. Okay. Are you aware of whether or not the law relative to your duties and obligations as an investigating social worker have changed over the course of the that, 28 years since you had that first training back in 1985. It's vague and ambiguous without sufficient foundation, but you may answer if you can. Well, I know that um I went through a training in 2009. 2009. To, um, we received this training on, on warrants. Okay. And it defined the reasons for obtaining a warrant, the causes, and the responsibility that we had. Okay. The investigation responsibility. The investigation responsibility. Okay. Is that where you first learned that you have to make an individual investigation and assessment of each child in relation to each parent? Does that refresh your recollection of when you first learned that? investigation and assessment of each child to, in relation to each parent. <clears throat> Does that refresh your recollection of when you first learned uh, when you first learned that? As I recall, that information was in it was in the training. It was covered in the training. The two thousand nine training. Yes. At any point in time prior to the two thousand nine training. Had you been formally introduced to that information? I can't recall. Okay, but you definitely recall it from 2009. Yes. Did you also attend the 2014 February?
training on civil rights and warrant procedures. Can you give me a little more information about that? I don't that? know the exact date when it was offered, and you may have already uh, promoted out of the unit by then, because I think you said you promoted out on February 6th. So you may not have attended the training. If you don't recall attending any similar uh, civil rights or warrant training in February 2014, then just tell me that. No, there was another, there was a training. I don't know if it was February, to be honest. It could have been uh, late January. Okay. Did you attend that training or do you recall? I did. You did, did. okay. Did. And that covered more or less the same subject matter as the 2009 training, correct? Yes. It was just more detailed. I believe so. Was there any other training between 2009, December, and late January, early February 2014 related to uh, the civil rights of parents and children and or the warrant and child abuse investigations that you recall? No. Okay. I'm gonna, uh, we'll just mark this, actually mark it and show it to you. And I have some questions about it. This might be a good time if you want to take your breaks yeah, and kind no, of transition at the moment. Yeah. The time is approximately 11.03 a.m. We're off the record. The time is approximately 11.23 a.m. We're back on the record. Okay. Uh, before we went on the break, I was getting ready to introduce to you an exhibit um, relative to the training that you underwent in 2009, and we will mark this as exhibit number one to your deposition. And I'll Thank hand you. that to you. If you could take a moment and just sort of thumb through it. I know that you've already reviewed this uh, earlier, or at least I think you've already reviewed this earlier with counsel. I think you said that. Um, but if you need another moment to review it again, that's perfectly fine. And I have one for you. You already have one, right, David? I do. Okay, did you Thank want? you. Okay. Just so the record's clear, um, this exhibit one begins with base number COLA03001 and ends at the last page with COLA03044. Does yours also bear those numbers? It does. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, Sean, did you say this is two? Exhibit two? No, this is exhibit one. One, okay. I sort of skipped ahead. Normally I do the notice first. Yeah, that's okay. okay. Okay, ma'am. Oh, I'll wait till you're done. Just let me know when you're done. Thank you. Sure. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Ma'am, you've had a moment to review the entirety of Exhibit 1, right? Yes. What is Exhibit 1? Exhibit 1 is a copy of our warrants in child abuse investigations, introduction to revisions to DCFS warrant policy and procedures. Now the title, Introduction to Revisions to DCFS Warrant Policy and Procedure, was it your understanding at the time that you underwent this training that in fact in December or around December of 2009, Los Angeles County was going through a process of revising its old warrant policies? Yes. And this training was to teach the social workers the impact of those revisions, correct? Correct. Okay. Do you know what specific policies were revised? <laughs> I can't recall. Unless it's Prior to the time that you took this training in December 2009, do you recall what the procedure was? Regar well, well, let me ask you. Do you recall what the procedure was regarding the circumstances under which a social worker with your unit would be required to get a warrant 
before they removed a child from its parents or caregiver? Well, it assumes the fact not in evidence, but you may you may answer CMR ZMR if you can. Repeat the question. Sure. Can I have the question reread, please? <coughs> As I recall, we did have a policy uh, obtaining a search and or custody warrant. And my recollection, my recollection was always to comply with the law and to ensure child safety and protection. Okay, when you say your recollection was that the policy was to comply with the law, Prior to December 2009, when you undertook this warrant training, what law was it you understood you were complying with? Well, um, as I recall, it was uh, it's the Constitution. Do you recall any specific amendments? Uh, not based on the training. We're talking about before you took this training. Well, I can't recall. I'm sorry. I'm not a lawyer. Okay, but okay I understand that. But you, you did testify that you recall prior to the time you took this training in December 2009 that Los Angeles County had a policy that you were familiar with that required you to comply with the law. That's what you told me, right? Yes? Yes. Okay. And what I'm wondering is, since the policy was required you to comply with the law, did you get any training to educate you about what the law was that you were supposed to comply with? Well, the law is that we cannot violate anyone's civil rights. Okay. We, we do not remove children from their parents without cause. Okay. Cannot remove, I want to make sure I got this right, children from their parents without cause. Without exigency. Without exigency. Mm -hmm. And that was according to your training prior to December 2009? Yes. Okay. And did they train you prior to December 2009 about what the term exigency means? My definition of exigency is that a child is at risk of abuse or neglect in the care of their parent or guardian. Is there any more specific definition that you've been taught? Exigency to me is that I have to we are responsible <coughs> for, ensure, for ensuring child safety. Above all else. Well, that's a little vague and big as above all else, uh, but you may answer. Our priority is child safety and protection. Above everything else. Again, same objection, but you may answer. It's case by case. Like everything, it's case by case. Let's go back to my original question. My original question was specifically in, your, in relation to your training, not what it is to you or what you may have looked up in a dictionary or something like that, but what Los Angeles County specifically trained you on prior to December 2009. What did they teach you regarding the meaning of the term exigency? Exigency is uh, in my training, as I, as I recall, is that a child is at imminent risk. Imminent risk. Imminent risk of what? Of harm and danger. What kind of harm and danger? 
physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, severe neglect. Neglect enough is enough? Well, again, to constitute are imminent risk case according to case. your training? Case by case. Wait, wait, wait. Please wait. Let's have Sean, you're kind of talking over the answer, and okay. Tiamara, you're wait, please, until the question. So I have a chance at least to hear the question, too. Well, I don't want you ahead. to hear the question. You might object. I want to just roll right through it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I might. I might not. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, anyway, back to imminent risk. There, there is actually training specific. Now there's training specific to the term imminent risk, actually defining imminent risk for you, right? <laughs> I'm talking about currently, as of January, February 2014. If you don't remember, it's okay to say you don't remember. Repeat the question. Sure. Can I have it reread, please? the way it's come out that way. It's vague and ambiguous, but if you can, you can answer it. Otherwise, maybe you can rephrase Let it. Let me sure. rephrase it. We'll, we'll go back, lay a little foundation. You told me earlier that you participated in the 2014 civil rights training that covered yes. these warrant issues, correct? Yes. Okay. And that was just, what, four or five weeks ago, right? Maybe six weeks ago. Yes? Yes. Okay. So it should be fresh in your memory. Yes. Okay. In that training, do you recall, either in the written materials or orally during the presentation, then the instructor talking to you about what the term imminent risk meant, specifically in the context of the work that social workers do? I recall um, perhaps it wasn't, and I can't remember. Okay. Maybe I can refresh your recollection. Does can, the can I just say one thing? Sure, Sean. If, uh, just as a hypothetical, I mean, mm -hmm. in, in the sense, if, um, well, uh, let me not say anything. <laughs> I don't mind if you want to help me. <laughs> no, uh, you know I think <laughs> I'll accept any okay, help. Okay, well, get. no, really, I don't want to. But here's the thing. I mean, CMR, if you if you you attended the training 2014, whether it was in January or February, I think what Sean is asking is, you know, do you remember what there was some discussion, whether it's in this exhibit or not, about you know imminent risk, what might constitute imminent risk, just in general, and I'm sure he'll get to this particular the case, sure. but. But just, I think that's what he's just trying to put into context. You attended, um, I think Michelle attended. Yeah. He's just trying to get an idea, you attended, so was there some discussion uh, when you attended of the concept of imminent risk? Right. That's, that's it. what I'm trying to talk Yeah, about that's here. exactly <laughs> it. It's not a trick question. Yeah. And the answer is yes. Hmm. Okay. Now I know that you may not remember the specific words that were used. But there was a specific phrase, wasn't there, that the presenter used when they were talking about imminent risk? Right? I don't recall. Okay. Let's see if this refreshes your recollection. Have you ever, have you ever heard the phrase, um, severe bodily injury or death? in the time it would take to get a warrant. Have you ever heard that phrase? Or read it? I believe so. I'm sorry? Yes. In what context did you hear that phrase, the phrase severe bodily injury or death in the time it would take to get a warrant? I believe it was in my 2009 training. Oh, in the 2009 training. 
So as early as 2009, you believe as you're sitting here today, that you recall um, seeing somewhere in some context the phrase severe bodily injury or death in the time it would take to get a warrant. Yes? I believe so. Okay. And what was the context in which you recall hearing or reading that phrase? It was in the decision whether to uh, remove a child or seek a warrant. Okay. And correct me if I'm wrong, but um, what, you're, what you were taught was that in making the decision whether to seize the child right there on the spot or wait and go to court and try to get a warrant to remove the child, you may only seize the child without a warrant if the child is in imminent danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death in the time it would take to get a warrant. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And you had that training as early as 2009? Correct. Okay. Now just to clarify my own understanding, when we're talking about the seizure of a child from its parents or caregiver, that's the same as a removal or, um, what do you call it, a de detainment, detention? What do you call it when you take a child? We take a child into protective custody. Yeah, but is that, you detain the child, you remove the child, what phrase do you guys use? We detain the child. You detain the child. So if I see in a document somewhere that the child is detained for example, a day in August, that would mean to me that the child was seized from the parent or caregiver's care on whatever particular day in August that is, right? Yes. Okay. Let me show you um, the petition. And I hate to remark this because we've already marked it on the yeah, I know. I just didn't want to. I have one here. It was marked as 12 to Michelle Loya's deposition. But if you want to remark it, that's fine. I don't really want to remark it because it's just extra paper. And Do I you want to just, we know what it is. Yeah, you we want me just to show um, yeah, what, Mara? Why don't we do this? Um, your attorney's showing you what was previously marked as exhibit number 12 to. Michelle Loya Michoya, Michelle Loya Chavra's um, um, deposition yesterday. And I'm going to ask you to look at that. Just the first page is all I'm going to ask you about for the moment. Do you recognize that document? That's the first question is just do you recognize the document? Seeing it now? Well, I think when he says do you recognize it, uh, CMR, it, it, do you know what it is? I mean, you, have you ever seen that before? Seen no, I have not seen this document before. Okay, have you seen okay. a document like this one at any point in the 28 years that you've worked for Los Angeles County DCFS? I have not. You've never seen a juvenile dependency petition? Um, typically, uh, I'm only responsible for the detention report and the minute order. Okay, so, so you've never seen one of these? No. Okay. Okay. That's a perfectly acceptable answer. I was, frankly, I was unaware of that. I always assumed, perhaps incorrectly, that in putting together the detention report, um, you'd necessarily have to look at the dependency petition, but I could be wrong. So let me just ask you that. When, when you, what do you do, or what did you do, in relation to your job as an SCSW with regard to detention reports? What was your job? My job was to consult with my social worker after they uh, responded to the home or the school. Consultation. There was a consultation. We discussed um, what was in the referral. S 
statements of the children, of the parents, were shared with me based on the investigation of the social worker. And if they were serious, we discuss, well, what are we going to do? But only always, if they were serious. No, no. Well, I take that back. We always discuss, one, to confirm and verify what was in the referral. And my worker called, we discussed, consulted, and based on the initial investigation, a recommendation was made or a plan was made of either um, if we were going to detain, we always talked about the warrant. If we were going to seek a warrant, then we were going to uh, complete the, the uh, uh, court, the report for the warrant, but if we had exigent circumstances where the child, the children could not remain or return home <coughs> because our fear concern was that the children would be abused. We would have to take them into protective custody, immediate protective custody. <coughs> Excuse me. Anything else? If we did not, again, as a supervisor, it was it's al it was always a case by case. Sure. Case by case. So that pretty much that pretty much sums Sometime, it up. Sometimes, sometimes we um, worked with the families by providing continuing a continued investigation. referred families to programs. Or close the case or the investigation. And by close the case, that would mean, or close the investigation, you mean you would evaluate it out or find the referral to be unfounded or inconclusive and then close the case and go no further? Is that what you mean? It, uh, <coughs> compound, but you may answer. And that evaluated out. That was not my responsibility to evaluate out. It was to close the investigation okay. based on the um, interviews and um, services we were going to provide the family. Okay. I guess evaluate out, that's a term that's typically used in connection with the hotline referrals, right? The screeners, the hotline yes. screeners. Okay, they would, at the first instance, accept um, allegations, look at it, and decide whether or not to pass it on to your unit. And if they don't pass it on to your unit, that's something they would have evaluated out, correct? Correct. Okay. And then when you close a case, you can't really close a case without some sort of finding, right? Either substantiated or unsubstantiated or inconclusive or, um, or unfounded, right? That's correct. So when you're talking about closing a case, what a sort referral. of... Or rather, closing a referral. I'm sorry. When you're talking about closing a referral, in what circumstances would you close a referral? Case by case investigation. Would you close a referral for abuse or neglect that was substantiated? Again, it's overly broad, but you may answer the question. Or would you move on and file a petition? Same objection. We could either close a referral and promote it to a case mm -hmm. substan substantiating the allegation. That's how we can close a referral, by promoting it to a case. Okay. Or you can close a referral by making an inconclusive or unfounded finding. That is correct. And not file a dependency case. Right? That is correct. Okay. <coughs> And when you were talking about 
the social worker calls you to consult and discuss what's going on in their investigation. And you talk about warrants, whether or not you should get one or whether or not you need one. And if there was an exigency and you had a fear that the child would be abused, is that where the whole term that we were just talking about, your fear was that the child would suffer severe physical injury or death in the time it would take to get a warrant? Is that the fear we're talking about? The fear is that I am concerned for this child's safety. And if I must remove due to um, that fear that something may happen to that child, I'm going to remove the child. Even if that's something that may yeah. happen is not immediate? No, it's immediate. Okay. It's exigency. There are exigent con circumstances where I'm going to remove that child. Doesn't it, children. Okay. doesn't it have to be, the exigency, doesn't it have to be reasonable and articulable, supported by, rather, let me start that over. Doesn't your claim of exigency, according to your training, need to be supported by reasonable and articulable evidence to suggest that the child will suffer severe bodily injury or death in the time that it would take you to get a warrant? Isn't that the rule you've been taught? So when you're talking about your concern for safety, we're talking about that rule, that you have to have evidence that the child will suffer severe bodily injury or death in the time it would take to get a warrant, right? Correct. Okay. So do you recall, before I get to that, to delay gratification, we have the detention report. I'll get to that. In this pile for more. Okay. Must be in this pile. This pile. Okay. This one I actually think I am going to remark even though we used it yesterday. That's fine. You should have one. Yeah, I have one from yesterday. I'll use mine. That. I thought I had one from yesterday. Yeah, there we go. Okay, I'm showing you what we will mark as exhibit number three to your deposition. No, I'm sorry, it's exhibit number two, right? Uh, three. Is it three? Yeah, it's three. Yeah, I don't think, oh, that, okay, I don't think right. we marked. Oh, we didn't mark this one? No, we marked one. We did not mark the petition. Do you want to mark it just for clarity purposes? We do have copies. No, the reason is that we're not really going to talk about the petition much. Okay. Um, I, it's sufficient, okay. I think, to identify it. So this is actually exhibit number two. Right. It's, it's, am I wrong? Yeah, no, exhibit one is, is uh, the training materials from today, right. I think, and so this would be two is my understanding. I believe we just identified as something for her to look the, at. The petition was the not petition. marked right. as an exhibit because it was marked yesterday right. as 12 to Michelle right. Sh Loya Shabra, but we just showed it to right. um, Ziamara. So the next exhibit for Ziamara's deposition would probably be number two. Two. Correct. And it would be the detention report, and I will. I have. You've got one. I've okay, got great. A fresh Thanks. Thank you. And do you want? Do you want? Oh, before we go, we should probably. What we were doing yesterday is helping out the court reporter by giving your um, an extra copy. We can mark those if you want. I'll uh, be glad to I do that. I can. I can. I can do that. Yeah. I believe I have an extra. You want, we want to put a little two on it, unless you yeah. want to put a tag. Okay. I can put a two on it. 
That makes it easy. That way she can keep her own copy. There you go. There we go. I'm not sure the record was clear on earlier, but I'd have to check it. On if we, we can clarify it, yeah, on exhibits. I'm you saying things. It, yeah, you might have liked it one or two. Or well, maybe. Let's, okay, we'll go back and check it. Let's, let's just do it right now. We have a little bit of confusion on the record as to um, the juvenile dependency petition, and council and I have agreed that we will not mark the juvenile dependency petition as an exhibit to this deposition. We all understand and agree that it was marked as an exhibit yesterday to Miss Loya Chabra's deposition as exhibit number 12, right? Right. As exhibit number 12, and we're showing it to the witness here today simply for, for reference and to refresh recollection, and we probably will not be attaching it to the deposition. Okay, sorry. <laughs> and you are exhibit number two. If you can take a look at that for me for just a moment. And then I'm going to ask you some questions about it. Just let me know when you're done. What is this document that you're looking at as exhibit number two? It is the detention. It's a detention report. And it's a detention detention of Kennedy and Goods. Okay, and just so that we have a clear record on this council, we had a stipulation yesterday that every time we reference the children, Kennedy and Goods will replace their full names in the transcript with the initials RK and KG. Yes. Okay. And that includes my current reference where I just said their names <laughs> too, right? Yes. Okay, thanks. And this is a detention report that you signed on August 23rd, 2010, correct? Yes, correct. If you turn to the last page of the exhibit, it doesn't look like it's actually numbered internally, but there is a number in the upper right-hand corner that says 0024. Do you see that? Correct. Yes. Okay. And then your signature would appear about the center of the page just above your name, right? Correct. Do you recall actually signing this document? I do. Okay. You see about, uh, what, three lines up, there's a statement there. It says, I declare under penalty of perjury that the foregoing is true and correct. Did I read that right? You did. Did that statement, that penalty of perjury statement, appear on the original document that you signed? Yes. And you read it before you signed it? Yes. You understood when you signed this what that meant, right? I declare under penalty of perjury that the foregoing is true and correct? Yes. You've had training on that? Yes. Are you familiar with a case called Beltran versus County of Santa Clara? No. Are you familiar with a case called Tomas versus um, State of Washington Department of Social Services? No. Okay. Did you have personal knowledge of any of the statements made in this detention report? Well, you'd have to, uh, I, I just want you to, re you, if you have to review it all to answer that question, fine. If you know, then that's fine too. I just. Well, let me lay some foundation. Maybe we can make this a little easier so you don't have to read the whole thing. You said that you consulted with Miss Loya Chabra, right? That is correct. That was over the telephone? Yes. You didn't meet with her in person? No. Did you review any documents in relation to that consultation with? Uh, Miss Loya Chabra. Uh, would you repeat the question? Did you, when you were consulting with Miss Loya Chabra about the contents of this um, detention report and her investigation, did you review any documents in relation to that consultation? Maybe an emergency response referral, maybe an email, maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, anything? 
At the time that I consulted with Ms. Loya Shabra, I had the referral. That's all you had? My, correct. That would have been the ER referral? Yes. Or the hotline referral, I'm sorry. Just the emergency response referral. How many pages was that, do you remember? I don't remember. Was it more than one? Yes. More than two? I believe so. Less than five? Perhaps. But you yourself had not gone out and spoken with any witnesses, correct? I did not. Didn't speak with the police? I did not. Didn't speak with Miss um, Ferguson? I did not. Didn't speak with her mother? I did not. You did not speak with her children? I did not. You did not speak with either of the fathers? I did not. And you made no attempt to visit her while she was incarcerated, Miss Ferguson, while she was incarcerated or anything like that, right? No. You did not review the police report, correct? We didn't. I do not recall having the police report at the time right. that we submitted. Right. So is it fair to say, ma'am, that you had no personal knowledge at all regarding the truth or the veracity of the statements made in this detention report? Wait. Well, okay. You can answer the question. It's argumentative, but you may answer the question. Michelle, uh, my Miss Michelle Oyashabra reported to me and shared all of the interview statements that were made to her, and. She reported that, and that was written and documented in the detention report. And I consulted and verified with her. Okay, but that was done over the telephone? That is correct. She told you, what did she just read it to you, say, I interviewed? No, I, I had the detention report. Okay, so you had the detention report. Yes, I did. And then you called her on the phone, right? I don't recall. Or she called you. Somebody, somehow you got on the phone with each other, right? Correct. And then you had the detention report in front of you? Yes. Did you go through it line by line? Yes. Every statement in here? Yes. And Ms. Chabra verified to you that the statements that she was making here, she said, oh yeah, those are true, or words to that effect. Yes. And that's all you did to verify the truth and veracity of the statements contained in this report, correct? And as I said, I reviewed the referral. I had the referral, the okay. Child Protection Hotline referral, the Emergency Response okay. referral. Yes. But you did no independent investigation on your own. Well, that's argumentative. Um, but you, you may answer the question if you understand it. Um, as far as my understanding, um, Michelle reported and documented the statements that she shared with me. Okay, move to strike non responsive. Can I get my question reread, please? Question, but you did no independent investigation on your own. Um, no. Again, no. no, you did not. Just the Child Protection Hotline referral and Michelle's consultation okay. and the detention report. Okay, but you did not go out yourself and interview witnesses. I think she's already answered well, that. Well, that, that, that's what I'm looking yeah. for is that either she did an investigation independently or she didn't. Yeah, I, and it just may be, I, I don't want to say too much, but I think she's answered it, but you can, you can answer it again. I did not. Okay. Am I correct that at the time you signed this document under penalty of perjury, the only information that you had were the hearsay statements of Ms. Loya Chopra? Well, that, that calls for a legal conclusion. It's asked and answered, and it's argumentative, but you may answer the question if you can in any other way. I did not consider them hearsay well, statements. You, okay. You did not get the statements directly from the witnesses interviewed, correct? I think 
gets asked and answered, but you may answer it again. I did not. Do you have any understanding through your training after 28 years with the agency as to what the term hearsay means? Just based on your training and understanding with the agency. If, if you don't, you've never had training, you've never had experience, then just tell me that. I have not. Okay. Have you ever testified in court before? I have testified in dependency court. Mm -hmm. How many times? Once. That's pretty good. Once in 28 years, I'll tell you right now, that's, that's something you should be proud of. That's actually pretty uh, impressive to me. How long ago was that? 1988. Wow. Hmm. All right, well, I'll just sort of kill that whole line. <clears throat> At the time that this detention report was filed on August 25th, 2010, were the children already detained? They were detained. Okay, and by detained we mean that the children had been seized from the custody and care of their parent or caregiver, right? Yes. And one of the ways that we know that, in fact, we can look back at what we previously showed you, which was earlier identified as exhibit number 12 to Miss Loya Chabra's deposition. And if you look down in the bottom right-hand corner, um, it's box uh, K, do you see that? Yes. And there's a check, not a check, I guess there's an X in the box next to the word detained, right? Does that date underneath it, where it says date and time of detention, does that tell us when the children were detained from the care of their mother or caregiver? Just for the record, let me make a foundational objection in sure. light of the previous testimony. Um, but you may answer the question if you know. Well, we, we can go back. Let's, let's do this, because I think, I think you, you've got a point there. I understand that you haven't um, necessarily seen a juvenile dependency petition before in its, this form, right? That's correct. But the data that appears in the CWS CMS computer system that you rely on to do your work contains the same information, just in a different form, correct? I believe so. So it actually says when you're sitting there in front of your computer, you can pull up a screen and uh, it's like a window. I don't know, do you guys use windows? I think so. Okay. I think you do. I, I just don't know. I've never actually seen it in person. I guess the county's paying Microsoft something for that program. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Every, everybody everybody pays Microsoft. Do. All roads lead to Microsoft. It seems to. But when you, when you pull up the data on that screen, it's the CWS CMS uh, system, right? Correct. Okay. You pull up the data and it actually tells you whether the child's detained or not detained, uh, where the child is, and when the detention happened, if the child was detained, correct? That's correct. And you, do you recall after uh, reviewing this document that was attached to Ms. Loya Chabra's deposition as Exhibit 12, does reviewing box number K refresh your recollection as to when the children were detained? Oh, you're looking at the wrong document. It's this document down here. In reviewing that, does that in reviewing that, does that refresh your recollection as to when the children were detained? I believe so. Okay, and when was it that you believe the children were detained? On August the twentieth, twenty ten at nine thirty. Now, there's, I have a little bit of confusion about that on my end, and it's, it's, it's my problem alone. It's, it's not anything, you know, because of you guys. But yesterday when we were talking to Miss Loya Chabra, 
what she had indicated was that the 9.30 a.m. was the time at which, together, you and her made the decision to detain the children. And what I'm hearing from you now is that this actually is when the children were detained. So I'm wondering, is there a difference between when the children were actually detained and when the decision was made, if you know? Okay, the question just assumes some facts. Um, it's foundational, but if you understand the question, you may answer. My recollection was that when the decision was made to take the children into protective custody, it was made on August the 20th at 9.30 in the morning. Okay, and when were the children to your rec oh, let me start over. <coughs> when were the children to your recollection actually detained? In my recollection, they were detained on August the 20th. Okay, when um, the decision was made. When the decision was made. And that was a joint decision, right, that you made together with Ms. Loya Chabra? That is correct. Was anybody else besides the two of you involved in making that decision? No. Okay. And just so I'm clear, you, when, when you decided to seize the children, you did not consult with your supervisor, a program manager or director, or anybody else. It was you and Ms. Chabra alone. Yes. Was that process consistent with your understanding of the Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Services policies and practices in place at that time? Repeat the question again. Sure, sure. Can I have it reread? Was that the process consistent with your understanding? of the Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Services policies and practices in place at that time? Yes. sort of loop back and talk about it again specifically in relation to this case mm -hmm. but you told me earlier that according to your training in 2009 we only seize children from the custody and care of their parents or caregivers when there's an exigency that is when there is reasonable and articulable evidence to support the proposition that the child is in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death in the time it would take a, to get a warrant, correct? Yes. Okay, so that's correct. Correct. Okay, that was your training? Yes, correct. Okay. Now on August 20th of 2010, how was Kennedy in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death in the time it would take to get a warrant? It was unknown. Um, when mother's release date and time would be from custody, from jail. She was arrested and um, it was a serious charge and we had to uh, protect the children. That's first and foremost, protect the children? Yes. Okay. Above all else? Well again, you keep using that phrase but it's vague and ambiguous, but you can answer. Yes. Okay. Even though according to your training, both parents and children have a constitutional right under both the Fourth and Fourteenth Amendments to due process of law, that is, to a warrant, unless the child is in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily death, severe bodily injury or death in the time it would take to get a warrant, right? Well, 
question's a little confusing, but you may answer the question. It, it's vague and ambiguous, which is the legal objection, but you may answer the question. If you need to, we can reread it. Sure. Can we have it reread? Okay, even though, according to your training, both parents and children have a constitutional right under both the Fourth and Fourth Fourteenth Amendments to due process of law, that is to a warrant, unless the child is in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily severe bodily injury or death in the time it would take to get a warrant, right? Okay. That's right? Yes. Now you told me that uh, at the time that you and Miss Loya Chabra consulted on the telephone, that's when you made this decision to remove the children, to seize the children, right? Correct. And there was just one telephone conversation, there weren't two? I don't recall. Okay. Do you keep phone logs? No. Okay. Do you recall whether the telephone conversation was over a cell phone or a landline? I don't recall. Was Miss Loya Chabra, if you know and you may not know, was Miss Loya Chabra in the field when she made this call? I don't recall. Okay. Does Miss Loya Chabra, to your knowledge, or did she, to your knowledge, at that point in time in 2010, have a cell phone issued by the county? I believe so. Do you know who the county service provider for cell service was at that time? I don't recall. Okay. David, is that something we're going to be able to get from you as the cell phone records? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you, I, you, if you send me a request, I'll look into it. Um, but I, I have no idea as to whether those things are available or not. Okay. But anyway, the, the point, I guess, is that as far as you recall, there was one telephone call, one telephone conversation. You consulted during that telephone conversation. You, together with Miss Loya Chabra, made the decision to seize the children. Asked and answered, but you may answer it again. Yes. Okay. And you said the reason that you seized the children without first getting a warrant was because you didn't know when mom would get out of jail and they were serious charges against her, right? That is correct. Okay. At 9.30 a.m. on August 20th, mom was incarcerated, right? She was still in jail. I, I, we don't know that. I did not know that at the time. You didn't call the jail to ask? Um, Ms. Loya Chabra went to Linwood, uh, the Linwood facility. Well, well, let me just stop for a second. Listen to the question. Can we have the question back again? Yes. You didn't call the jail to ask? I believe Michelle did not. Okay. Let me, let's hear the question again. He's saying you. I, I did not. Right. I did, did not. Okay. Did you ask Miss Loya Chabra whether or not she called the jail to ask whether or not mom was still incarcerated? I don't recall. Did Miss Loya Chabra ever tell you, I called the jail and she's no longer out? or she's no longer incarcerated, she's getting out in 10 minutes or something to that effect. I don't recall. Did either of you, well, I, I don't know what she necessarily did, did you call the prosecutor, <coughs> the prosecutor's office, and ask them what was going on with the case? I did not. Okay. According to the training that you took, aren't you required to undertake reasonable investigations to ascertain whether or not a child is in imminent danger before you make the decision to seize that child? The facts were that... Oh, okay, no. listen, listen oh. to the question. Okay. Listen to the question. Okay, according to the training that you took, Aren't you required to undertake reasonable investigations to ascertain whether or not a child is in imminent danger before you make the decision to seize that child? Yes. Okay. Am I correct, ma'am, that in doing all of the things that you did on August 20th, which includes consulting with Ms. Loya Chabra, 
reaching the decision with her to seize the child without first obtaining a warrant. All of that. And then detaining the children. All of that, as far as you know, according to your training, was consistent with the practices and customs employed by social workers with the Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Services. Okay, asked and answered probably for the at least the second, if not the third time, but you may answer it again. Please repeat the question. Sure. And then maybe if we're reaching a break point, it's 12.15. Sure. Um, Sean, I'll, I would just suggest that we consider that. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. Please rephrase the question. Okay. We can back up a little bit and take it little pieces at a time. We've already talked about some of it. I was just trying to get a little summary all in one gulp. Maybe it's too big of a gulp. So let's break it up. You, on August 20th, sometime around 9.30 a.m., consulted with Ms. Loya Chabra regarding her investigations. Right. Yes. Together, during that telephone call, the two of you reached an agreement that you would seize the children from the custody and care of their parent or caregiver, right? Correct. Without first getting a warrant, correct? We discussed it. We discussed it. Okay, but listen to the question. Yes. Let's yes. listen to the question. Yes. Okay. And you did not get a warrant? We did not get a warrant. Okay. At that time, mom was still incarcerated, correct? I don't know. Because you didn't make any independent inquiry to figure it out, right? Well, that's argumentative. But you may answer the question. I did not. And then the children were seized by Ms. Loya Chavra with your agreement, correct? Correct. And all of that, that we just talked about that sequence, that was all consistent with your understanding of the practices and customs employed by social workers like you by the county of Los that work for the county of Los Angeles according to your training, right? Well, that's overly broad as to circumstances, but you may answer the question if you can. I would like to, for, for you to rephrase the question. Was your conduct consistent with the customs and practices of Los Angeles County uh, Department of Children and Family Services? Again, it's overly broad, but you may answer the question. Can you rephrase it? I can, if that's the best I can do. S repeat it then, please. Okay. Yeah, have let's it have it reread. Mm -hmm. Listen to it carefully. Was your conduct consistent with the customs and practices of Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Services? Yes. Okay. And that's according to the training that you've had both in 2009 and 2014, right? Yes. And in fact, over the course of your entire employment, with the department of 28 years, it's still consistent, right? Whoa, 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 whoa. That, that's a little, over, that's overly broad. No, but you, I mean, if you can answer the question, go ahead. Yes. Okay. We can take a break, I think. Sounds good. Okay, take This is the end of videotape number one. The right, time is approximately 12.21 p.m. We're off the record. This is the beginning of videotape number two. The time is approximately 1.34 p.m. We're back on the record. Okay. All right. Before we had taken off for lunch, I believe I had already 
spoken with you a little bit about exhibit number two, the detention report, correct? Correct. And then we were also talking about um, the information you had available to you on August 20th at 9.30 a.m. when you had your conversations with Ms. Loya Chabra when you guys were making the decision to seize the, the children, right? Yes. You recall that testimony from earlier in the day? I do. Okay. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that you had told me that at that point in time on August 20th, you didn't know um, whether mom was still incarcerated or when she was getting out. Is that right? I knew what Michelle told. I, I knew from the facts that mom was still in jail. Okay, you knew she was still in jail? Yes. Okay. Did you also know that at that time on August 20th at 9.30 a.m. in the morning, the jail was on lockdown? I don't recall. Okay. Now, when you signed the, well, you, you did sign the detention report under penalty of perjury, right? Correct. You reviewed it before you signed it? Correct. At some point in time prior to, let's see when you signed this thing, uh, you signed it on August 23rd, 2010, right? Correct. Okay. At some point in time prior to signing this detention report, um, were you able to review it on the computer? I don't recall. Okay. Do you recall when you were consulting with Miss um, Loya Chabra on the telephone? on August 20th at 9.30 a.m. Do you recall whether or not you had the information contained in this detention report in front of you while you were speaking with Ms. Loya Chabra? That's vague and ambiguous. You may answer. Well, hold on, hold on a second. <coughs> I mean, if, can I hear it again? And if I have a problem, I'll try and fix it. I, I don't want it to be vague. Do you recall when you were consulting with Ms. Loya Chabra on the telephone <coughs> on August 20th at 9.30 a.m.? Do you recall whether or not you had the information contained in this detention report in front of you while you were speaking with Ms. Loya Chabra? I do not recall. Okay. Well, you consulted with her on the 20th by telephone in part to decide whether or not to seize the child, right? Yes. Did you have any information available to you at that point in time other than the emergency response referral? Any written materials? I don't recall. Okay. Were you at your desk when you took this call? I don't recall. Is there any other place at the office where you normally take calls to consult with your subordinate social workers regarding seizing children? I take them at my desk. Normally? Normally. Is yes. there a computer at your desk? Yes, there is. Okay, and does that computer have access to the CWS CMS system? Yes, it does. Okay. Is it your normal practice? I, I recognize that you may not remember specifically what you did in this instance. Is it your normal practice when you're doing these consultations to actually pull up the computer file uh, regarding the investigation and review the material that's in the database as you're consulting on the telephone with the social worker? Many times I do. I did. Okay. Do you recall whether or not you did that in this particular case? I don't. And when, when you, according to your normal practice, when you sit down and review what's in the computer system while you're consulting with these social workers regarding whether or not to remove a child, the entire um, universe of data related to that investigation is available on the system to you, right? you understand the question? No, please rephrase it. Yeah, let me, let me try to lay a little foundation. I'm going to show you 
what we will mark as exhibit. I did it again. Exhibit number three to your deposition. I'm going to ask you if you can review that document. It appears to consist of approximately 28 pages. And just let me know when you're ready. seen a document like that one before <coughs> at any time in your 28 years with the agency? Yes, I have. Okay, what is that <coughs> document? This is a delivered service log of all contacts, services, and visits, and this is what um, we enter when we've made a contact with the family um, while we're investigating a referral. Okay. Um, you also make entries in the delivered service log for contacts other than family, right? Yes. Okay. In fact, you may make entries in the delivered service log when you contact another social worker. Yes. Or a social worker supervisor. Yes. Or a doctor. Yes. Or any other collateral witness. Yes. Okay. Now, the delivered service log, that, that's a official database that's operated by your agency, right? I mean, you guys rely on this. This is official data. Yes. Okay. And in fact, the social workers that come along later after your emergency response investigation is done, they have access to the same database, right? Yes. And in fact, they can pull up um, the results of your investigation or your subordinate social worker's investigation and read it to see where the case has been before they pick it up, right? Well, it might be overly broad, but you may answer. Yes. Okay. And I, I might have asked you this already. Um, I think I did, but I'm asking again just to make sure I covered it. The, the delivered service log and the data contained in it this is an official record of the County of Los Angeles, correct? Well, that may call for a legal conclusion, um, but you may, I mean, if you know. I mean, it, it, it's. Here, Sean, here's some, I'll meet you sure, on it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, I don't know if that's the way to establish the foundation. I don't, I'd have to look at the thing. I, I assume with this has been produced in the course of discovery, right. so I probably have no problem labeling it an official record. I just think it calls for a legal conclusion. But you may answer the question to the best of your knowledge. I don't well, know. Well, let me ask it this way. I think this might be a better way to, to go at it. Is there any other document that you rely on more for the data that's contained in these delivered service logs than the CWS, CMS delivered service logs? Is there any, any document of any kind that you would look to as a better source of information? I don't know. The one document that you do know of where you can pull it up and read the entire history of the case, the investigations, the witnesses we spoke with, the social workers that were involved, what happened is the delivered service log, right? And that information is contained in the delivered service log. Okay. Are social workers required, according to Los Angeles County's customs, policies, and practices, if you know, to record the things they do, the contacts they make in the delivered service logs? Yes. Yes. In fact, the yes. mantra is document, 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 right? Well, I don't know whose mantra, but assuming, it, I mean... Well, we can go to the training and we can go through that. No, I know it's in the training, you know, document. I, I know the little reference, etc. But I think you've established, yes, you should put the... Okay information when you have a contact in. Let me get my last question reread and see if we can get an answer to that. Uh, the 
question. The mantra is yep. document, 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 right? Yes. Okay. And when we say in the training, document, 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 we're talking about your contacts. Document your contacts, right? Yes. Your investigations, your interviews, right? Yes. What the people say, right? Yes. Okay. Do you get any training as to why it's so important? to document, document, document? Well, that essentially you need training, but you may answer the question. Can you re rephrase your question? Uh, sure, can you reread it, please? Do you get any training as to why it is so important to document, document, document? It's our job to document. We document. But why is it important? Because it's important to document every statement that is given to us to describe, to enter telephone calls. It's a part of the case. It's a part of the investigation. It's a part of the referral. I understand that the rule is to document and the types of things that you want to document. What I'm wondering is if you've been taught or learned or told why it's so important to document those contacts, every person you talk to, everything they tell you, everything you've done in the case. Why is that so important? Asked and answer. It's important to document the facts. It's important <coughs> to document the information. Is, is it important because other people in your agency at some point later after your investigation is finished are going to go back and read and rely on what you put in your documents? Is that one of the reasons it's so important? Yes. Okay. And in fact, they're going to make um, important decisions about the particular family you're investigating based on what you've documented, right? Yes. So, in fact, it is critical that when you're documenting these events that you lay out in this delivered service log that you are truthful, honest, accurate, and complete, correct? Yes. Because if you're not, then the whole system doesn't really work properly, does it? Oh, that's a little overbroad and calls for speculation. But you can answer. Repeat the question, please. Sure, can I have it reread, please? According to your training and 28 years of experience with the agency, the due process rights that we talk about in your training, they rely very heavily on complete, honest, accurate, and truthful reporting, right? Well, again, that's vague and ambiguous. It may call for a legal conclusion, but if you understand, you may answer. Yes. Would you agree with me, ma'am, that if a social worker was not complete, honest, truthful, and accurate in their reporting, that that could, according to your training, severely impair a child's or parent's constitutional rights? Just according to your training. I, I, well. That's completely calls for a legal conclusion and speculation, and it's vague, ambiguous, and overly broad. I mean, you you can answer the question yes. if you understand. I'm sorry. Your answer was yes. Yeah. And you've actually covered that subject matter in at least your 2014 training, right? 
Can you be specific, please? Well, we're talking about the documentation requirements, the investigation, how you need to be truthful, honest, accurate, and complete. You understand? You with me? Yes. You've specifically covered those requirements, that requirement, at least in your 2014 training, right? Yes. And I think you have an acronym for that, don't you? You guys have acronyms for everything else. <laughs> you have an ac acronym for that, too. I'm just wondering if you know what the acro acronym is. And what's the acronym for what? For the obligation to be truthful, honest, accurate, okay. and complete in your court reporting. I don't know. You don't remember it? No. Okay. Let's see if we can refresh your recollection, and then we'll ask some questions about that. Or is it in an exhibit? It's not in an exhibit yet. Oh. <coughs> I think it was this one. Oh. Does the acronym FACTS mean anything? F-A-C-T-S. I, I don't recall. Okay. Did you stay through the whole training, the, the one that was in 2014, late January, early February? Did you actually sit through the whole uh, presentation? I recall I did. Okay. You don't recall leaving early or taking a break and not coming back, something like that? No, I don't recall. Okay. Were there sign-in sheets at that training? Did you have to sign in? Uh, when you went in and sat down for it? I don't know. Are there normally sign-in sheets when you do these sorts of trainings where it's going to be like a half day or something to that effect? Are there normally sign-in sheets where you would sign in, sign your name to show that you were present at the training? Yes. Do they take breaks during the training? They do. Do you have to sign back in when you come back from a break? I don't know. Okay. Have you I ever had recall. to do have you ever had to do that? Yes. Okay. Was that, is that the normal practice, is that you'll sign in when you get there. When they take a break, you'll sign in again when you come back from the break. Is that the normal practice? Um, without foundation. But you may answer if you can. Well, we can lay foundation. How many, of, uh, how many trainings have you attended in the 28 years that you've been with the agency? I don't recall. Maybe hundreds. Maybe. Right? I don't recall more than 50? Yes. Okay. And in those more than 50 trainings, some of those you had to sign in at, right? Yes. And on some of those, you, you took breaks during the trainings, right? Yes? Yes. And after the breaks, you came and you signed in again on some of those? Yes. Okay. So you actually signed in twice, once when you first got there and once after the break? Yes. Okay. Do you recall on the February January, February 2014, when you just did six weeks, eight weeks ago. Do you recall whether or not you followed that same practice? I don't recall. Okay. But you know you signed in at least once. Yes. Okay. Now, if I wanted to get a copy of your sign-in sheet, what would I call it so that you would know exactly what I'm looking for when I send a document request? I don't know. Does it have a title? Does it say sign-in sheet, January civil rights class, or something like that? Possibly. Okay. Who would you talk to to find out back at your office? My former office. Your former office. That's right. I'm sorry. Uh, Emilio Mendoza. Can you spell that for us? E-M-I-L-I-O Mendoza, M-E-N-D-O-Z-A. And what's his position there? 
he is the program manager for MART, for the multi-agency response team. And he would know who maintains the sign-in sheets for the trainings, specifically for the civil rights training that you I, I believe so. Okay. Do you recall that civil rights training that you took in uh, January, February 2014? Was that mandatory? Were you required to take that? I was going to transition out of MART, and I was in that meeting training. I chose to stay. Okay. I think the question, though, is it, was it required? And if you know it was required by some uh, policy or the department or something. Or a directive. Or a directive. Yeah. There was no, I, know, the I don't know if there was a directive. Uh -huh. um, I don't know. Okay. But at least as to you, it wasn't required because you were leaving anyway, right? You were leaving that department anyway. You were that there by section. choice. That section, that section. Okay. But you were there by choice. Right? Yes. Okay. Do you know about your subordinates? For example, Ms. Loya Chabra, do you know whether she was required to attend? I was, I was not her supervisor, so I don't know. Yeah, listen to the question yes. again, CMR. Can we have the question back again? Yes. Do you, do you know about your subordinates? For example, Ms. Loya Chabra, do you know whether she was required to attend that training? I don't know. What about your own subordinates? You just indicated that Ms. Loya Chabra was no longer your subordinate by um, January, February 2014. Did you have people that were subordinate to you in January, February 2014? On that day, yes. Okay. How many? I believe there were four. four. Were they required to attend that training? Yes. Who told them that they were required to attend that training? I don't know. Okay. But you know somebody told them? Yes. Okay. Did that directive come through you and get transmitted to them, or were they told that directly from some other source? Some other source. Who? Mm, Mr. Amigo Mendoza. Okay. So Mr. Mendoza was the one that came down and said, look, all you people are required to attend this training, or words to that effect. I don't know. Well, then how do you know it was Mr. Mendoza? Oh, well, it was Mr. Mendoza, but I don't know if he phrased it that way. Well, that's what I said, words to that effect. In some way, regardless of the specific words he used, the intent was all the social workers were required to attend that training, right? Yes. Do you know why? Why they were required? It was not uh, something that they could opt in or out of? I don't know. Okay. Did anybody ever explain that to you, why it was so important? that it was a required training? It's argumentative. You can answer the question. I, we, pre, we typically will get training, and that was one, one of the trainings we had. But not all of the training is required. Some of it, the social workers can go to or not go to, right? We, this training was mandated. I understand oh, this listen, particular listen training. Listen to the mm -hmm. question. Listen to what he asks. I understand this particular training was mandatory. Yes. I'm going to ask her to reread my question, though. Um, but, but not all of the training is required. Some of it the social workers can go to or not go to, right? Yes. Okay. But this one, specifically the February, January 2014, it was mandatory. They didn't have a choice. That's my recollection. Okay. Is your recollection the same as to the December 2009 training that it was mandatory? They didn't have a choice? That's my recollection. Okay. I thought that was the case. I just want to make sure. And as part of that 2014 training, that's where you learned for the first time, and correct me if I'm wrong, but for the first time that you need to be honest, accurate, truthful, and complete in your documentation, correct? Can I have that question back again? Okay, 
okay, and I thought that was the case, I just wanted to make sure. And as part of that 2014 training, that's where you learn for the first time, and correct me if I'm wrong, but for the first time that you need to be honest, accurate, truthful, and complete in your documentation, correct? If, if you don't recall, it's perfectly fine well, to, to tell well, us that. Yeah, I mean, if you if you can't answer the question the way it is, he'll rephrase it. But if you need to have it repeated, they can repeat it. Please repeat it. Okay, can I have it rewritten, please? Now listen to it carefully. Mm -hmm. The problem is with the question is it's you have a lot in there, and then there's a question in there someplace. But there's a lot of am I correct? Correct me if I'm wrong. That kind of stuff. I understand. So. It might be better to rephrase it. Uh, let's listen to it, and then I'll see if I can. If there's a, if I still feel, if I feel like there's a problem with it, I'll, I'll do something with it. And as part of that 2014 training, that's where you learn for the first time. And correct me if I'm wrong, but for the first time, that you need to be honest, accurate, truthful, and complete in your documentation. Correct. Please rephrase your question. Okay. That 2014 training, that was the first time that you learned that you have to be honest, accurate, truthful, and complete in your documentation and reporting. Please rephrase your question. I can't rephrase okay. it. Can I have it reread? That's the best I can do. If, if your answer is, I don't remember or I don't know, that's a perfectly fine answer. Right. Uh, let me just say, I mean, as I listen to the question he's asking, was that the first time you ever learned? In a training, a yeah. formal training. No. Is that the first time? Right. Yeah. No. Okay, let's, let's get it clean. Yes. Let me have the uh, question read into the record and then an answer. Yeah, it's a team effort. <laughs> okay, that 2014 training, that was the first time that you learned that you have to be honest, accurate, truthful, and complete in your documentation or reporting? No. When was the first time that you learned that in a formal training? In my academy training. Oh, in your 1985 academy of training, training, did they specifically address the social worker's obligation to be truthful, honest, accurate, and complete? I believe so. Okay. And those are the documents we spoke of earlier. See, this is the thing, is I have 1995 forward, and I know it's not in there. Um, so it's the 1985 stuff. Is that what you're talking about, is the documentation you got at that six-week DCS training academy in 1985? That's my recollection. Okay. We're really going to need to make an effort, David, to locate that because all of the other academy trainings I have do not address in any way truthful, honest, accurate, complete. It's just not there. Yeah, as I said before, I'll, you know, you guys send me a letter or a formal sure. request and, and identify it and I will search for it. In fact, I can represent to you, and this is really good, by the way, on the part of the County of Los Angeles, they're training now, 2014. Yeah. It's much. In fact, it's probably ahead of the rest of the state. This is the first time in any training from any county that I've seen this actually addressed, addressed. directly. And, uh, you know, I commend you for that. You guys have done a good job on that. Well, I'm, I'm entirely responsible for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think my request for production of documents is. <laughs> this happened after. All right, well, you can get some credit. You can get credit, too. you got to give credit where credit's due. I'm not evil all the time. Okay, so going back then to your delivered service law. When you were consulting with Ms. Loya Chabra at 9.30 a.m. on August 20th, when you guys were making the decision to seize the children without first obtaining a warrant, do you recall whether or not you reviewed the data that was available to you in the delivered service log on your computer while you were doing that telephone consultation? I don't recall. 
you recall hearing at any point in time during your conversation that Mr. Garrick Goods reported that it was an accident, it was not intentional, and that the child was not injured, she was strapped into her car seat at the time. Do you recall hearing that during your telephone conversation? I don't recall. Okay. You don't recall one way or the other. You could have heard it, might not have heard it, you just don't recall. I don't recall. Okay. I'm going to ask you to look at page one of exhibit three. Down at the bottom of the page, about the last 13 lines or so, I'm going to ask you to read that to yourself. Let me know when you're done. I'm done. Okay, did that refresh your recollection at all as to what Miss Loya Chabra disclosed to you regarding her conversations with Garrett Goods during your August 20th conversation? Um, May, well, no, no. Nothing. I withdraw my request, my half request. I don't recall. Okay. I'm going to ask you to turn to exhibit number, I think it's two, to your deposition, page 17. Oh, oh, okay, on the, on the yeah, top. Yeah, I was looking got at the it, right Got it, got it, sure, thank you. I'm sorry, yeah, it's page five on yes, the bottom. Yes, got it, sorry okay. And the, uh, let's see, one, two, third paragraph down, beginning where it says, okay, it says, CSW asked father to explain what had transpired on the 14th. He said, quote, I don't know what happened. We had been arguing, nothing physical. I know that she had wanted to get back together again. We broke up and I moved out in April. I saw her on Sunday. I got into my car and left. She went after me. I don't think that she did it, parentheses, hit him, in parentheses, on purpose. I could see that she was rolling down her window on the passenger side and was trying to talk to me when it looked like her other foot hit the accelerator. That is when she hit my car. I had sustained damage to that side of the car prior to her hitting my car. I told the deputy that the very same night, end quote. Does that refresh your recollection regarding the substance of your conversations with Miss Loya Chabra on August 20th at 9.30 a.m.? Well, I'd like to make a correction. You said I saw her on Sunday, and it was Saturday. Did it say Saturday? You, you verbally said. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, I'm fine with that correction. The point is, does that statement refresh your recollection as to the substance of your conversations with Miss Loya Chabra on August 20th at 9.30 a.m. when you guys made the decision to seize the children without first obtaining a warrant? I don't recall. Okay. Now, as of August 20th, neither you or Miss Loya Chabra had yet obtained the police report, correct? Let me rephrase I, that. Mm -hmm. As of August 20th, 2010 at 9.30 a.m. in the morning when you two together made the decision to seize the children without first obtaining a warrant, neither of you 
had yet obtained the police report. Is that correct? I don't recall. Okay. I'm going to ask you to refer to exhibit number three. Take a look at page three of exhibit number three. And the second to the last contact where it says, it's at the bottom of the page, it says contact date 8-19-2010. You see that? 19, right here, yes. Uh, towards the bottom of the right page. Here. Michelle, I'm starting. Oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry, Eight nineteen. okay, yeah. And it says, on behalf of goods, that would have been the daughter, correct? Yes, wait a second, we're... You're all the way at the bottom? Eight I'm all the way at the bottom of okay. page three of Contact date. Yes, yes, <coughs> yes. And it says here the contact purpose was to investigate a referral, right? That's yes? That's correct. The staff person was Michelle Loya or L. Loya. That's Michelle Loya Chabra, mm -hmm. right? That's yes? Yes. And then the participants, it says method email. And then below that entry, there's some text. Yes. Okay, and it says to please call and request the police report or words to that effect, right? Yes. And at the bottom of that, that's your name? That's correct. Did you send, do you recall sending Miss uh, Loya, Ch yeah, Loya Chabra an email asking her to go get the police report? I believe I did. And that's because you're looking at this and it refreshed your recollection, right? Yes? Yes. Okay. You have to remember to respond audibly. I know. Thank you for the reminder. She's, yeah, Thank she's you. trying to write it all down. <coughs> Did you produce that email with you at your deposition here today? Did you bring it with you, a copy of the email? Well, that assumes it's an email. Well, it says it was an email. Here, well, here but, where it says method. Let yeah. me ask her. Oh, okay. Where it says method, email. What does that mean? I must have sent her an email through CWSCMS mm -hmm. requesting the police report. And if it had been by a phone call, for example, you would have picked up the phone and then it would say here, method phone, right? Yes. And you, you guys actually, um, I believe, I learned this yesterday, maybe you have something different to say, but I believe that you guys use an email system that's operated through Outlook, correct? Yes. Would this yes. have been an email that you wrote through Outlook? I, I don't recall. But you do recall now, after having read this, that at least as of August 19th, you did not even have the police report, and you had asked Miss Loya Chabra to go get it. Well, it assumes facts, but you may um, answer the question. Repeat the question, please, sir. Yeah, can I have it reread, please? Okay, but you do recall now, after having read this, at least as of August 19th, you did not even have the police report, and you would ask Miss Miss Loya Chabra to go get it. Is that a question? I can have her reread it. Sound like a question? Well, to if me. you understand it, go ahead and answer it. Or I can put a uh, inflection with an interrogative participle at <laughs> the end of it if that helps. Oh, uh, that would help. Do you understand? Well, if kind of speculating that... Well, let me ask you this. Yes. Why on earth would you send her an email saying, go get the police report, if you already had the police report? Well, I might call for speculation. You can answer. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Repeat the question. Yeah, can I we get it rewritten? Thank you. That's okay. Then after this, we need to take a little break because I need to refill. I don't want to get the sure. shark thing going again. Um, court reporter's going to ask. Yes. Um, why on earth would you send her an email saying, go get the police report if you already had the police report? Uh, that's 
argumentative, but you may answer. I don't recall. Okay. Do you recall whether or not Miss Loya Chabra told you she already had the police report? I don't recall. Would it be important to you as the supervisor, the person making a decision whether or not to detain a child without first obtaining a warrant, would it be important to you to know the other side of the story, what mom had to say? Well, uh, you may answer the question. It's, it's argumentative. Based on my training, yes, um, it's my understanding that my social workers always present to me the statements of all of the parties. And you trust them to do their job properly? I do. You don't actually go out and verify it? Well, that's vague and ambiguous and overly broad, but you may answer. I trust that what they are reporting mm -hmm. and documenting it's honest. Okay. Can I get the actual question reread, please? I'm not sure the answer was responsive. Uh, the question, can you trust them to do their job before? Before that, yeah. Would it be important to you as a supervisor, the person making a decision, whether or not to detain a child without first obtaining the warrant, would it be important to you to know the other side of the story, what mom had to say? Again, based on my training, I trust my social workers to provide me with that information, that those facts. So as their supervisor, the person in charge of these subordinate social workers, it is not important for you to know mom's side of the story. Am I correct? Well, no, that's argumentative. I think it misstates the testimony, but you may answer the question. It's important to me that as their supervisor, as their supervisor, and they are providing that those statements to me. They are providing those statements to you. Can Can you do me a favor because I I need to take a little break. Yes. Sure. Um, but I'm going to ask you these delivered service laws. You told me earlier that they contain uh, all of the contact services and visits that yes. happened in the case, Yes, right? yes. And I have looked through these myself to find any kind of contact with mom prior to August 20th at 9.30 a.m. And maybe I'm missing it. Maybe I just don't know how to find what I'm looking for. But you've told me just now that the social worker's statements regarding mom are in here. So I'm going to ask if you can find that for me. Well, I'm not, I, I think that's, I, I understand you'll, you'll clarify, but I, just for the record, I know it wasn't a question, but I'm not sure that that was an accurate assessment of the testimony. Well, but we can clarify. Well, can I have the, her, her testimony reread, please? Maybe I heard it wrong. Yeah, maybe I heard it wrong. Maybe I heard it wrong. <laughs> okay. We'll find out. I need to look at it. Why don't we take a little break and I'll look at yeah, it. Yeah, we can we'll come back to I, it. I've got to clarify it. The time is approximately 2.19 p.m. We're off the record. The time is approximately 2.32 p.m. We're back on the record. Okay, there was a part of uh, the testimony that we found um, during the break that the reporter is going to read back uh, to you to sort of give you the context. So if you could listen uh, carefully to what she's going to read to you, and then I'll ask a foundational question, then we'll get to the main question. Okay, this is your answer. Again, based on my training, I trust my social workers to provide 
provide me with that information, those facts. Question. So as their supervisor and the person in charge of these subordinate social workers, it is not important for you to know mom's side of the story. Am I correct? And there was an objection. Answer. It's important to me that. Question. As their supervisor. Answer. As their supervisor. And they are providing the, those statements to me. Okay. Question. They are providing those statements to you. Now, when you say that it's important to you as their supervisor, and I want to be specific here to Ms. Loya Chabra in relation to um, the children here, in this case, the Ferguson case. Yes. It was important to you to hear mom's side of the story before you made the decision to seize the children. Am I understanding you correctly? Well. Okay, you can answer the question. Repeat the question. Can I have it be read, please? Now, when you say that, that it is important to you as their supervisor, I wanted to be specific here to Ms. Ch Loya Chabra in relation to the children here, in this case, the Ferguson case. It was important to you to you to hear mom's side of the story before you made a decision to seize the children. Am I understanding you correctly? Yes. And do you recall whether or not in that August 20th, 2010 telephone conversation at 9.30 a.m. when together you made the decision to seize the children without first obtaining a warrant, do you recall Miss Loya Chabra talking to you about her conversations with mom? I don't recall. Okay. Do you believe she did? I don't recall. Okay. One way or the other. You'd have to ask Michelle. But you do agree that it would have been important to your decision making process to hear mom's side of the story? Well, if she just tested but she just answered that. So the answer to my question is yes? Repeat the question. Can I have it rewritten, please? But you do agree it would have been important to your decision making process to hear mom's side of the story. Given the situation, we had a decision to make and we took protective custody of the children. I, I given the circumstances of child protection. Sure, I understand that. I appreciate that you volunteering that information, but it's non-responsive to my question. Can I have the question reread? You do agree it would have been important to your decision-making process to hear mom's side of the story. Well, past that answer. Well, she didn't answer. It was non-responsive. No, but she's answered it two or three times before, but you may well, answer it again. I'm not going to argue about it. Can no, I don't want to argue. Yeah. Just uh, to the best of your ability, if you can answer it any other way, please go ahead. See you tomorrow. Do you need the question reread? Please. Or rephrased? You can reread it. to circumstances that you may answer if you can and ask an answer. I don't know. Okay. Am I correct that as of August 20th at 9.30 a.m., the only information that you had, you and Ms. Loya Chabra had, relative to the events that took place on the, I believe it was the 14th, August 14th, the only statements, the only witness statement that you had at that point in time was the statement from Garrett Goods. May I have that question read back again, please? Sure. Okay, am I correct that as of August 20th at 9.30 a.m., the only information that you had, you and Ms. Loya Chabra had, 
relative to the events that took place on the, I believe it was the 14th, August 14th, the only statements that, the only witness statement that you had at that point in time was a statement from Garrett Goods. Let me just redo that. That was all chopped up. Am I correct that as of August 20th at 9.30 a.m. when you had that conversation with Ms. Goya Chabra, the only witness statements that the two of you had available to you were the statements of Garrett Goods in re the describing what happened on August 14th? No, they are not correct. Okay, who else did you have statements from describing what occurred on August 14th? We had the mandated reporter. Who was that? The deputy. And I don't recall his name. The mandated reporter, arresting deputy, who called in the referral to the Child Protection Hotline. Have you produced that referral to us in Discovery, if you know? I don't know. Okay, who would we go to to get a copy of that referral? I don't know. Okay, if, when you go back to your office today or tomorrow, if you wanted to find out how to get a hold of that referral, who would you talk to? Please repeat the question. Can I have it reread, please? Okay, when you go back to your office today or tomorrow, if you wanted to find out how you can get a hold of that referral, who would you talk to? I would probably have, I would ask County Council. County Council gets the referrals? No. I can't access a referral. Well, you get the emergency response reports, right? Those are those are available on the CWS CMS system. If I'm investigating a case. Mm -hmm. But those are available on the CWS CMS system, correct? Well, well uh, without mm -hmm. foundation, uh, without foundation and overly broad, but if you can answer the question, go ahead. Repeat the question. The emergency response referrals they are available on the CWS CMS system, correct? Again, same objections. Not correct. I would have to. Um, if I'm looking up a referral, mm -hmm. I would need to look up that referral for a reason. Okay, that where was job related. Okay, let's presume for a moment you have a reason. Where would you look? What's the process, the steps you would go through to find that referral? It is on CWS CMS. It is on CWS CMS. So you would sit down in front of your computer. Let's go through the steps together. Yes. You would sit down in front of your computer, right? Correct. You'd type some data into it. Correct. Right? A name, perhaps a case number, correct? Referral number. Referral number. And then some data would pop up on the screen, right? That's correct. And that data would include the, s the referral itself, correct? Correct. Okay, so it, that's one way that you could go about getting it. Yes. Okay. In coming here today, let me ask you this. We'll just mark this as an exhibit um, number four. I think that's number three. We should put that tag on that exhibit. And then number four is where we're going. Okay, I'm going to show you what we've marked as exhibit number four to your deposition. It's titled Notice of Deposition. And David, I don't know that I have another copy of this. That's right. I, I have one somewhere. Okay. Have you seen this document before, ma'am? No. You've never seen this document? You can take oh. a moment to review it if you need to. Morning. That's a long document. Yes. I think we discussed that this morning. Brief. Can we take a little break yes. here sure, for a sure, second? Sure, sure, sure. The time is approximately 2.43 p.m. We're off the record. The time is approximately 2.48 p.m. We're back on the record. All right. Um, I've made a request of uh, Sean and Liana that we uh, suspend this deposition. It is definitely not complete. 
I've made the representation upon inquiry to my client uh, that she's tired. Uh, she's expressed that to me. I'm concerned um, that if we go forward, the record may not be clear. I feel an obligation ethically and professionally to request that we suspend it to be rearranged at a second, uh, for a second time when the witness is feeling better and not as tired. Uh, she is a defendant, so it is important. Um, I understand there's a cost. Leanna has raised the issue of the cost, and we'll meet and confer on that. I do understand that. We will, in good faith, produce uh, uh, as soon as practicably possible uh, Ms. Uh, Flores Hogan uh, for a completion of the deposition. There is a substantial amount to cover. Uh, I know that from Mr. McMillan. I understand it. Uh, and he has, and Leanna has been kind to understand uh, the, the request to postpone the deposition or suspend it at this point. Uh, there are some other documents that we're going to have to produce in any event. We will get back to you as soon as we can. I know we've had difficulty filling dates, uh, but it's not because everybody hasn't been trying. So I am requesting on behalf of my client to suspend the deposition at this, at this point in time to be reconvened as soon as practically possible. And I, I'll just say that we understand what's going on. We understand the position. Um, we're not going to beat you up over it. Thank um, you. It's frustrating, somewhat frustrating for us, because we are on a, a very limited time schedule here, and there's a lot of work to get done. Before. Right, there is, and I will take responsibility for this. Uh, it's my request, and um, and I, I thank you for the accommodation. And again, we hope you feel better. Okay, so, sure, sure. Shall we use the same stipulation we used last time? That's fine. Is that okay, Ms. Court yes. Reporter? Great. This is the end of videotape number two and the end of today's videotape deposition. The time is approximately 2.51 p.m. We're off the record.